Thank you so much, uh, especially to Professor Apurva Patel and the IQTI team, uh, Sri Vidya ma'am and Surabhi ma'am for uh, enabling my visit and giving me this opportunity. Uh, today I'll talk to you about a collection of few works that uh, I was involved in throughout my PhD and my postdoc. Uh, and this comes under the general umbrella of evaluating fault tolerance schemes for noisy hardware. Um, I am a senior scientist at Xanadu Quantum Technologies, a startup based in Toronto. Uh, before I continue, uh, I want to thank all the great people that I had the opportunity to work with. In particular, for this talk, the, these four people. Uh, of them, the most important in my life is uh, David Pullen, the, the person at the top. Uh, he was my master's and my PhD supervisor who very unfortunately passed away uh, soon after my PhD. Uh, so before, before going on to the actual subject of this talk, I just want to tell you that, uh, tell you where this talk falls in, in the grand scheme of things when we look at quantum computing. So I'd like, I like to classify it in three stages, depending on the scale of systems we are looking at. So the first stage is microscopic studies, where we are thinking about how to define a qubit, how to encode information, a unit of information in a physical system. Then we have intermediate scale studies, where we look at what if I have a handful of these physical systems, what useful things can I do, what schemes can I show proof of principle for, and, and in general, how can I display quantum effects? This sometimes, can also be called miscara, but here we are really worried about just a handful of qubits. And then ultimately we want to solve real world problems. So we want to scale up these studies for uh, over like hundreds of thousands of qubits. And there the interesting problems are essentially using macroscopic scale system to combat errors, error correcting codes. And then we want to do quantum algorithms and so on. Much of today's talk will actually lie in the intermediate regime, which interestingly comes in the interface of theory and experiments. And in particular, I would tell you today about what happens to quantum error correction as a theory when we look at it at the microscopic level. 
So when we go away from the pen and paper models of errors and we actually look at realistic hardware. And then I would I, I want to point out some fundamental problems that arise in in analyzing these fault tolerant schemes or quantum error correcting codes on noisy hardware. And then finally, I want to conclude by showing you some of our recent work on de devising efficient diagnostic tools to study quantum error correction. Okay, with that being said, let's go into the content of today's talk in specific, and I'll tell you the problem at a very high level. As, as we all know, quantum computer can be thought of as a very at a very abstract level, some elaborate quantum circuit where the components, which are the wires here, the qubits, and the gates are highly susceptible to errors. And quantum error correction as a theory is designed to ensure that despite errors occurring in these circuits, we still want to have a reliable result of the circuit. The technique at a very high level is, is recommending us to, to basically not encode information in individual units of that circuit, which are the qubits, the wires there. Instead, think of information spread across several qubits in the sense that now I, I denote my unit of information to entangle states of many physical qubits. And here we like to think of these physical qubits as part of some error correction code. And this, these qubits are designed such that if some of these qubits undergo errors, then I can still retrieve the collective information that's stored or the entangled state that I intend to start with. Now, the, the first question that comes about in these schemes is, okay, we basically prescribed a scheme where we essentially added an overhead to our computation. So for every logical information qubit, we recommended several physical qubits in the algorithm. So the natural question is, how much of an advantage do I get in this scheme? How much can I suppress the error that actually affects the encoded logical information? To answer these kind of questions, we'd like tradition, the error correction literature answers these kind of questions using a plot of this nature, where on the x-axis we have all the imperfections that go on at the hardware level. So this is called the physical error rate. And on the y-axis, we have the imperfections that, that actually lead to errors on the logical information that's encoded in the entangled states. So a negative slope curve like this says that there is some benefit to error correction in the sense that given some physical error rate, we get a better logical error rate. Now the question is, the question is really that we, we want it better and better. In particular, we want to achieve some target that is demanded by some application. So the error correction theory also guarantees that you can pack in more and more physical qubits to represent a logical qubit to get better and better error suppression. Now, the natural question that follows is that if I have a target how much overhead do I need? How many physical qubits should I use to represent one logical qubit? And for that overhead, what quality of physical components do I need? What quality of physical, what, what quality of engineering do I need to, to achieve to have these physical qubits to have the physical gates? And a related question is basically to try and reproduce this plot before con constructing a quantum computer itself, in the sense that given all the details of the physical hardware, we want to accurately predict the performance of an error correction scheme. This is the big problem. Now, now before telling you how we solved it, let's just dive into the solution directly to get a feel of what the problem is and how we want to answer it. Now, one, one natural thing that we can expect is that if we are given the entire device coming from a lab, coming from an experimental platform, we can mathematically model that device and then study the error correction scheme as a quantum algorithm in the sense that we can now simulate that quantum algorithm on a classical computer. So the extraction part is called a full process tomography. And the, the simulation part, as, as you would know, is 
is numerical simulations of quantum error correction. Now, you can, you can expect that both these are hard problems. We are trying to mathematically model a time evolution process, which has too many parameters, and the modeling is also not reliable. And of course, numerical simulations are hard. So what do we do? We instead, we look for properties of the device or of the noise process that can quickly tell us what the logical error on the encoded qubit would be. What are these properties? It turns out that there are several interesting properties that we can consider for noise processes. For theoretical reasons, people have been studying what's called the diamond distance. It's at this point, you can think of it as a function that basically reports a number for a noise process, and that number tells you how much noise there is. There is another such function called the fidelity. Now, they have their own interesting aspects. Fidelity is, is easy to estimate in experiments. Diamond distance is good for proving theorems. Now, what happens is that diamond distance can, cannot be efficiently measured or computable, unlike uh, computed unlike fidelity. And, but the real question that we are looking for is can either of these help us answer the problem which is accurately predict the performance of a quantum error correcting scheme? And what we found out was in fact it does not. If it does not, what is the natural follow-up of that would be to come, come up with another figure of merit for a noise which would be another way of quantifying the strength of noise in a device, which can accurately estimate how much strength, how much noise will actually result in the logical qubit. And this metric is what we found in a follow-up work, and we called it a logical estimator. Now, having, having a metric like this, then we showed that this logical, Having a quick way to estimate the performance of a quantum error correction scheme, we said now we can use that as a tool to not only study one scheme, but also compare different schemes. So this is all the results at a glimpse. Now let's go into the details and try to understand why this problem is hard and what's the relevance of the solution. Okay, so we, we kept talking about like physical errors and logical errors. Let's understand Essentially, this graph in its great detail, let's look at the x-axis and then the y-axis in some sense. So let's now look at what we mean by physical errors. Now, as you know that a quantum system is basically some device, it's, it's experimentally some device that is sitting in a lab and it cannot be, a, it cannot be completely shielded from its environment. Now, what happens is that the, the quantum system interacts with its environment. If you think of it as a physics uh, context, you can think of some Hamiltonian that couples the system to its environment. And like this, the interactions go on. And then B, it's a unitary time evolution of the entire system. Now, of course, we can't measure everything in the environment to completely characterize it. So B assume a model where we don't have access to the environment and we only see what, what is the net effect of this interaction on the system itself? Now, it turns out that this net effect of on the system itself is what is called popularly in quantum information as a quantum channel. So we'd like to imagine our input state described by some density matrix going through a channel that models all the interactions with the environment. <laughs> What are popular examples? Well, like for, for the longest time, uh, we have been finding it comfortable to deal with toy models of these quantum channels, where we'd like to think that the interaction with the environment can be thought of as just randomly applying one of the four Pauli matrices to the, to the quantum system. And this is because it's Pauli matrices, it's also called Pauli channel. And because it has a nice classical picture in the sense that it's a probabilistic application, it's attractive to do proofs with these kind of models. Now, as, as some of the experimentalists here would popularly know, if you only restrict to applying the Z Pauli matrix and not doing anything, this is also called a defacing channel. And in superconducting or many other architectures, we associate this to something called a T2 time scale of the qubit. Now there is 
that's not limited to just poly matrices. There is a very important physical process that is related to an energy decay in the quantum system, and that's called an amplitude damping channel. And here, damp here, like uh, if the in if the system is in a state row, after the error has occurred, after it has in interacted with the environment, the state at some after some time t or the output of the channel is given by this expression where a0 and a1 are these matrices. Now this begs a, a general description of what a channel could be and it turns out that a channel is nothing but any mathematically valid process that maps one density matrix to another density matrix. And here these kind of processes are characterized by what's called a completely positive trace preserving map because positivity and trace trace one are the two properties that need to be preserved. So when we say physical errors in any hardware setting, we are basically looking at the space of all possible completely positive trace preserving maps. Okay, so now we have these these functions of density matrices, what is it that we really care about in these functions? We just want like a number that tells us how much noise is there in this completely positive trace preserving map or the respective quantum device. And to do this, we want some function of this noise which, which can actually give us a number whose value is monotonous with the, with the strength of noise and it can tell us how much noise is there? Some popular metrics are the diamond distance. So it is, remember that noise is something that you can think of as taking as input the, the perfect system and giving as output the noisy system. So you can think of the maximum distance between the input and the output, and that's like the strength of noise. Infidelity or one minus fidelity is, is now, not the maximum difference between the input and the output, but the average difference. And this is attractive because it can be measured by what's called randomized benchmarking experiments. And because it's a mathematical object, one can consider different mathematical figures of merit like L1, L2 norms, inversement distance, unitarity, something called the channel entropy, and so on. Now, we have all these figures of merit of a noise process. What are we really looking out for in these figures of merit? Well, we, the gold standard is that we want a figure of merit that we can use in proofs. We want something that we can measure in experiments. We want to efficiently compute it in simulations. We, we also wanted to answer our main question, which is predict the error on the logical qubit. Now, it just for a survey, it turns out that diamond distance is the only one that can be used in proofs. Fidelity is the only one that can be measured. Most of it can be com uh, computed efficiently in simulations, except for the diamond distance. And when it comes to answering our question prior to this work, it, it was not known if any of these metrics can actually give us a good estimate of what the logical error would be. And this is what we want to answer. OK, so we looked at physical error processes and what is it that we want from these physical error processes? We want a figure of merit that can predict the logical error rate. Now we kept saying logical error rate. Let's now look at what we mean by logical error. So let's let's go back to our let's go back to our little cartoon where we said one qubit is encoded in an entangled state of many qubits and formalize that. What happens is that if we have an information encoded in just the bare qubit, it's susceptible to errors. So what we mean by mapping it to an entangled state is formally called an encoding process. It's a unitary map that guarantees a one-to-one -one transformation between, in this case, a single qubit state in the input to an n qubit state at the output. And this means that for every different single qubit state, I will have a different n qubit state. And those states are such that if I change a few qubits in the state, I can still recover the properly mapped single qubit state. Now, 
our quantum computer starts off in this n qubit state. And because it interacts with the environment, what happens is that there is noise. And this noise now affects the individual qubits. You might ask, why does it affect each one separately? It can, uh, it can be a correlated noise. And that makes the problem a little more complicated. For illustrative reasons, let's think of it as independently affecting the single qubits. And now comes quantum error correction. It's in two parts, as you can imagine. Error correction first demands that you detect the errors and then you correct based on what you detected. The detection part comes out of doing, doing some restricted set of measurements because we don't want to do all measurements and collapse the information. We do a restricted set of measurements which are called stabilizer measurements in quantum error correction. And these measurements are done by coupling the system to an ancilla system to some qubits outside the computer and measuring those qubits. And it's formally called a syndrome measurement. Now, these measurements give us partial information about the type of errors that, that the system has undergone in the form of epsilon. Based on these measurements, we basically pre post process the data, which is also in literature called decoding. And this post processing recommend this post processing recommends a correction or an operation that needs to be actively performed on the system to get rid of the errors as much as possible. Once we've done that, we can say with high confidence that what we end up with should be what we start what we started the quantum computer with which is the encoded state. Because of this, for mathematical reasons, we can effectively say that we, we started off by trying to encode some single qubit state. We did error correction and hopefully we got back the single qubit state that we intend to encode in the first place. Now, this won't be always possible. And that means there is there is, because of noise and error correction, there is possibly an effective transformation that happened on the encoded information. And because we can think of it as an effective transformation, we can now black box this whole thing, and we can say, this is an effective channel that has described to me what happens after encoding, noise, error correction, and unencoding. So like this, I can now forget about the details of the quantum error correction process itself and just think of it as I started off with a situation where I had physical noise described by epsilon. After all this mechanism, I got a situation where I have effective noise labeled by epsilon one. And I have only benefited if epsilon one has lesser noise than epsilon. Only then has quantum error correction helped me suppress errors. Now, this gives a good way of suppressing errors by some amount that depends on how many physical qubits have been used. Now, what if that's not enough? If that's not enough, the, the theory recommends that we just do it over and over again. We can think of starting with a single qubit information encoding it in n physical qubits, and then taking each of those single qubits and encoding it in n physical qubits again. As you can see, there's some recursive structure to this, and because of that, these types of encoding schemes or quantum error correcting codes are called concatenated codes. Now we can really think of the computer as being prepared like encoding system. And after, after the desired amount of time, you're written as well. We, ba we basically stop the encoding process and those many physical qubits.
Sorry for that. No, no, there was an issue here. <laughs> Somebody in it. And there's a question. Uh, I are guess. you okay to take it? Yes, yes, sir. Question is what about error propagation in the concatenated scheme and its final error on the affected channel? Yes, yes. Okay, yeah, this is a good question. So errors can propagate on the concatenated scheme, and this effective channel ensures that whatever is remaining, whatever cannot be corrected by one code block, propagates to the upper level code block and is corrected there. Okay, so because of this effective channel picture, now we can essentially, we can run this from the lowest level of encoding to the highest level of encoding. And like this, we get an effective channel for the full concatenated code. Now, why did we use concatenated codes? It's just, an, it's just a tool for us to keep re-encoding information until we have reached the suppression level that we want. So this effective channel method is is good at studying not only single error correcting codes, but also concatenations of several error correcting codes. Now we, we basically saw a way of, 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 of understanding noise on physical systems and metrics of noise, how to characterize strength of noise on physical systems and what we mean by logical noise, which is the effective noise after error correction. Now let's look at what we need to do with these two quantities. Remember we had physical channels. Now we can compute effective channels from these physical channels by actually, by actually computing the effective channel of a concatenated scheme. I won't go into the details of how to do it, uh, specifically, there are some mathematical nuances there. And uh, if anyone is interested, please talk to me or it's detailed in this uh, in this package that we have. So now before error correction, we had our physical channels for which there are several figures of merit, like the physical error rate, <coughs> the infidelity or one minus fidelity or the diamond distance and so on. After error correction, we have our effective channel and the effective channel is also a quantum a quantum channel, so we can study any figures of merit on that effective channel, and that quantifies the error on the logical information. So now we have the same kind of metrics like diamond norm, we have fidelity L1, L2 norms, and because we want to consider some metric that we can also possibly measure at the logical level, for this talk we we'll take the fidelity of the logical channel to represent the logical LLB. Okay, so let's let's pause at that picture where we understood physical channels, physical error rate, logical channels, and logical error rate, and see what is it that we want. Now, given a device, we basically want to say if I have a device whose noise strength is one percent according to any of these metrics. Can I, use, can I use it in a fault tolerant algorithm? In other case, can I predict the logical error rate with these devices? And now the question we want to answer is what measure according to those functions will help me obtain an accurate estimate of the logical noise strength? Now, what we want to show is we want to basically reproduce that figure that we had in the very beginning but with, with these general definitions of physical noise processes. So remember we had, we had these kind of uh, plots that we wanted to show to show how good a quantum error correction scheme is. And in this plot, what we want to say is given the noise according to some... I'm sorry, I think this is a continuation of the same question in the previous section. So the upper block is also faulty, then it becomes difficult. The faulty mode is probably probabilistic. So how can you guarantee the probability one? Yes. So yes, yes. If the okay. So here we are taking we are taking a more rudimentary version of uh, fault tolerance where 
where we don't account for noise in the error correction gadget itself. So it is possible that a code block of quantum error correcting code can itself have noise in it. So we said we do partial measurements to get information about the errors. These measurements themselves can be noisy, which means we have to add additional layers of redundancy to these measurements like repetitions in the Shor's error correcting scheme or an encoded Ansela and the Steen error correcting scheme to get rid of those errors. Now, if we have those errors and we don't take care of it in every code block, the errors will propagate and then we cannot guarantee logical information to be protected. But here we are ignoring that problem to have a more simplistic study. Coming back to our, our issue, we want to basically say for a device, which is a point here, it's given a physical noise strength for that device, we want a scheme which can tell us the logical noise strength. If, if we have basically placed a device in this plot, we have basically said that given its physical noise strength, I can infer this to say it's logical noise strength. Now, that is good, but, but then if I have a different physical noise strength corresponding to a different device, I want it to have to basically not be aligned to this because then it will mean that for the same physical noise strength, I have two different devices with two different logical error rates, which means that physical noise strength is not giving me enough information to pinpoint a logical error. In particular, we want to avoid this kind of a scenario where given only the physical noise strength, we have several devices or several noise maps with the same physical noise strength, but with a variable logical error rate. This means that given only the number according to the physical error rate, I cannot say anything. And for reasons, because this now looks like a dispersion, for in some cases where the dispersion is not visually apparent, we can use a metric to point. Okay, now let's let's go right into the problem and see and study the, 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 the use of each of these standard error metrics in predicting the logical error. Let's take diamond distance. So here what we have done is every point here is a valid physical noise process. Its x-axis is telling us the physical noise strength according to the diamond distance, and its y-axis is telling us the logical noise strength for some concatenated scheme. And here, what, what we have to note is that if I take a vertical cross-section, I'm looking at different hardware settings. I'm looking at different mathematically valid physical noise maps, albeit simple model of errors. I'm looking at different mathematically valid noise maps up in this green line that have the same value of the diamond distance, in this case, 10%. And the, and the spread in the Y is telling us the different logical error rates that it can have. And here you see that the spread goes over about eight orders of magnitude, which means that, which means that given only the time and distance, I cannot accurately say what the logical noise. Now for the experts, you might wonder, amongst all these noise processes, if I only knew the diamond distance, what should be the worst type of noise I should be prepared for and the best type of noise? Now it turns out that the worst type of noise is decoherence in the qubit. The best type of noise is unitary errors or calibration errors. Okay, now let's look at fidelity, where we are saying that instead of the diamond distance, Let's say we only knew the fidelity of a device and it's allowed to be in, we know no other information. So we are looking at, in this cross section, we are looking at all physically valid noise maps whose fidelity is say 93%. Now you see that the logical error rate still varies over about five orders of magnitude, which means that knowing only fidelity and nothing else about the hardware tells us very little information about what the logical error rate would be. Now, if you look at, if I only knew fidelity, what is the best noise and what is the worst noise? It actually flips in the sense that 
if you only know fidelity, you would be prepared for the worst noise to be calibration errors or unitary errors and the best noise to be decoherence. Now, I pointed out this split because it kind of, it reiterates the point that not only are the metrics good enough to predict the logical error rate of individual noise processes, it cannot even tell us reliably what is the best and what's the worst. Okay, so with that, let's, let's do a short recap. We wanted to know which of these figures of merit can accurately predict the logical error rate. And then, and then I showed you two examples, uh, but in this work, we considered a few other examples of standard error metrics. And in this work, and in this PhD thesis, a part of this thesis, we showed that none of the single, uh, none of none of the standard error metrics are good at predicting the logical error. Okay, so now we saw why standard definitions of noise strength do not work. Now I want what in what follows, I want to show some attempts at deriving a figure of merit for a noise that is in fact good at predicting the logical error rate. Now to do this, we will actually we will take a twofold process, a twofold approach. So first we 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 acknowledge that errors can be complex in nature in the sense that we are looking at all possible time evolutions of a single qubit here. So that can have multiple parameters for us to actually like take all of them and recommend one figure of merit for these 12 parameters. So what we will do is first we will recommend an active way of removing the dependence of many of these noise parameters on the logical error rate. And this technique is, this is achieved by a technique that, that exists in literature called randomized compiling. I will, I will go into what that technique is, but roughly you can understand that initially we looked at the model of Pauli errors, which was a simple toy model. And then we said errors can be more generic than that which is a completely positive trace preserving map. Here, this is an active technique of basically removing all the parameters in that completely positive map where you can actually reduce it to the, to the good old toy model of Pauli errors. Once we have done that, we need to understand what are the different Pauli errors that occur in the system. To do this, there is a well-known technique called noise reconstruction. Now, now we've got, now that we've gotten all the information about the Pauli errors, we can be sure that we have completely understood the noise dynamics in the system. The last part is to actually use this information now in an efficient manner to, to find a good approximation to the logical error rate. Now note that if we don't, if we don't care about efficiency, all we are doing is doing a full scale numerical simulation with a complete mathematical model of the noise. We want to avoid doing this and we want to come up with an efficient but still accurate estimate of the logical error rate with these Pauli error probabilities. In what follows, I will give you a flavor of all these three steps. So let's look at the first step. Now, now we, it turns out that if you look at the space of all completely positive maps on a qubit, you might ask how many parameters do I need to completely specify a noise process? Now, rem remember that single qubit states can be represented as a vector where every component basically tells you what is the trace of the density matrix with a Pauli matrix. This is because Pauli matrices form a basis for single cube for Hermitian matrices. Now, because of that, every channel can be viewed as an affine transformation on this vector that represents the density matrix or what you would be used to as a block vector. Now, because 
because this transformation also has to preserve positivity and trace one, you can prove that it will have 12 independent parameters instead of 16. And, and randomized compiling now can be thought of an active process where, where after applying that process, we are only left with four parameters out of these 12. And each of these four parameters actually are related to the probability of the four Pauli errors that the system undergoes. And now noise reconstruction is an experimental technique to estimate the value of these parameters. OK, so now what we've done is we've simplified the noise in the system and we've extracted the relevant information about that simplified noise. And for those who wonder how randomized compiling actually works, what it prescribes uh, in, in the context independent of quantum error correction, what it says is that if you have a circuit whose elements undergo any type of noise process, what we want to do is we want to essentially randomize the input state to this device by applying a random Pauli matrix before and after every component here. So these Pauli matrices are called twirling gates. Technically, what we do is we, we segregate the gates in the circuit according to two sets, which are, which are called easy and hard gates. And then we basically apply random Pauli gates before and after every easy gate. What this ensures is that if noise affects as a completely positive map for each of these gates, the average effect for all these randomizations will now look like a Pauli noise process. Once we have, we have applied these Pauli random gates, now we can basically, through linear algebra, we can absorb these random gates into the existing gates in the circuit and just perform that absorption, gate, which are called rest gates. Now, this ensures that the effective noise model on the circuit gates now for the average over all possible randomizations is a Pauli error model, which is easy to work with. OK, we basically take that, that essence and apply it to our setting where we have logical gates and quantum error correction protocols. What we do is we say every logical gate can now be randomized with the random Pauli operation, and that Pauli operation can just be absorbed into the quantum error correction protocol. And this ensures that what I have for the quantum error correction scheme is an effective Pauli error model. So now I only need to study the performance of the scheme against Pauli errors. Remember, and I can also get all the information necessary about these Pauli errors through noise reconstruction. Now the problem is, with all this information, how am I going to reach the logical error rate? Remember that if we only have Pauli errors, the, the error that persists on the logical information is basically the errors that cannot be corrected by the error correction scheme. So we only have to look at those errors that cannot be corrected by the scheme and sum the probabilities of all these errors. This is the total probability of error on the logical qubit. Now you may say that looks easy, but it turns out that if you look at all the errors that cannot be corrected by a scheme, there are an exponential number of these errors. So it does not make sense to count through this exponentially large set, because then it boils down to just simulating a quantum computer on a classical computer. So we want to quickly estimate the total probability of uncorrectable errors, or one minus the total probability of correctable errors, in time that does not scale exponentially with the size of the system. Now this is in general not possible, but it is just possible because our concatenated codes have a special tree-like structure in the encodings in the encoding scheme. And how exactly? 
we look at it. So it turns out that you can now take the, the encoding circuit and now view it as a tree where every node here is basically a quantum error correction process. And, and it's related to different quantum error correction processes for the for the logical qubits in the lower lower blocks. Now, because of the structure, you can say that the total probability of uncorrectable errors is basically uh, or correctable errors is basically those errors that can be corrected in the individual blocks. Plus, which is the blue part there, plus those errors that are passed to the upper level block and corrected there. So now we have a nice recursive relation which actually can be solved and we can get the total probability of uncorrect or correctable errors for the entire tree. This is not exact because it, it actually removes so possibilities of certain errors that you can leave as uncorrect that remain uncorrectable here but are corrected several blocks later. But for the for the purpose of having something easy to estimate, we ignore those errors. And this means that what we get is an approximation to the total probability of correctable errors. And then we can go ahead and show that this approximation is good enough, this approximation is efficient, and so on. Now, the bottom line of this story is that we, for concatenated codes, we have an efficient way of approximating the logical error rate from experimental data. And this efficient approximation is what we call the logical estimator. This is now an operational figure of merit for a physical channel and an error correcting code. Now we have, we have basically found a figure of merit. Let's go ahead and see how useful it is. Because we need to now compare it with the standard metrics and highlight its use. So let's go back to our picture where we had, where we basically said uh, we are going to use a plot like this to say how good an error metric is. Except now we have two things to compare. So we have we have this plot with the top x-axis representing our old metric, with the bottom x-axis representing our new metric. So if you if you now see every pair of points in gray and red represents a device, except the gray part is telling us the correlations between the old fidelity and the logical error rate. The red part is telling us the correlations between the new logical estimator and the logical error rate. And as you can see, the logical estimator is much more correlated with the logical error rate, which means that its value can be used to estimate the logical error rate with greater confidence. Let's compare it with diamond distance. In the diamond distance case, the conclusion is similar, except it's a little more dramatic because the diamond distance now has a lot. The, if you look at the variation of the logical error rate with the diamond distance, as we also saw before, it is large. But in contrast, we have a much tighter prediction of the logical error rate using the logical estimator. And this, along with comparisons of other metrics, basically tells us that the logical estimator is much more useful at solving the problem of predicting the logical error rate for concatenated schemes. OK, so we, what we had is that we said what we want is to accurately predict the error on the logical qubit after an error correction scheme. We showed how the standard figures of merit don't work. And then we showed, we showed another figure of merit, which we call the logical estimator, that does a better job at predicting these logical error rates. Now that we have a fast way of predicting what the logical error rate for a specific scheme is, let's now use it to not only work for a specific scheme, but also compare different schemes to see which is better. Now, let's say we have two different error correction schemes. The question is, 
which is a better error correction scheme? And often the answer is unclear because the answer can only be apparent if we do, if we construct an error, if we take an error model and do a numerical simulation to study the logical error rate or the effective channel for the two error correction schemes. But now we saw that something else answers the same questions as the intensive numerical approach, which is the logical estimator. So let's take an example. Let's say we had we had two different schemes. One is called the steam code. Don't worry if you don't know what a steam code is. It is essentially an error correcting scheme where one logical qubit is encoded into seven physical qubits in a specific manner in such way that it's at the seven qubit state is a plus one eigenstate of some Pauli operators. Now, that is not the only way of encoding one logical qubit in seven physical qubits. There is another way. And that other way, one of the other ways is called a cyclic code. And that recommends that be encoded in seven qubit states, which are now eigenstates of some other operators, namely these and the cyclic shifts of these operators. Now you don't have to get a feel of these operators. Just remember that there are two different encoding schemes. Clearly the eigenstate of this is different from the eigenstate of this. Now the question is, let's say I have some noisy device. For example, I have a device where with some probability PQ, I have a rotation about a poly axis that uh, that, that depends on Q. In this noisy environment, I have some, some number that tells me how much noise is there, relative, how much relative noise is there between the phase and bit errors and so on. In this noisy environment, I want to know which of these two schemes or its concatenated versions is the better one to use. And I can do, I can answer that question by, by doing a full numerical simulation of the concatenated code um, and estimating the logical performance. So here, if let's only focus on the dashed lines. The dashed lines, what it answers is that it takes each of these schemes and for every value of the noise parameter, we consider a full time evolution, a full scale simulation of the error correcting scheme, and we report what the logical fidelity of the effective channel is. Now, the, these, this dash plot it takes several hours on a big cluster, so it, it is probably an error. Uh, it is uh, a very uh, time intensive process to get this information. Now, what it reveals in the dash plot is that, is that depending on the value of the bias in the device, some parameter that tells me the relative probabilities of Z type and X type errors, one scheme is better than the other. In other words, at low bias, which is low values of eta here, the, the steam recommendation is better because it has a lower logical error rate. At high values of the bias, the cyclic recommendation is better because that has a low logical error rate. Now this information is crucial because if we didn't know that, we are basically used suboptimally using our resources. Now what we show is that this kind of a prediction can be can also come out with reasonable accuracy from the logical estimator, which is the solid lines. Because it predicts the logical error rate accurately, it also predicts this crossing point, which says that which says this is the value of the bias or the noise rate above which one scheme is better than the other. So this is to highlight like an important use of, of being able to predict the logical error rate, which is it can also compare two different schemes and tell you the optimal one for a specific noise setting. Okay, so hopefully I've showed you uh, I've showed you some uh, leads at answering the question of if I have a hardware device, how do I find out if it achieves a target logical noise stress? And we said that the standard metrics don't work. So what we recommend is computing the logical estimator 
and seeing if it satisfy or satisfy some target achieved or that's that's need required by an algorithm and we also showed that this logical estimator can not only answer if it satisfies a target it can also help us choose the better of two schemes for a specific noisy environment now i just want to summarize and say that although we have been talking all the while about concatenated codes there's another set of interesting quantum codes which are called topological codes which are attractive for some uh, hardware platforms where we need not only locality but geometric locality we want qubits to be physically near each other for uh, easily coupling these qubits and so on topological codes delivers these good properties and in a supplemental work we extended this logical estimator calculation also to topological codes uh, in particular surface codes okay and then the the other question that is interesting is now that we have all information some microscopic information given by noise reconstruction can we use it to enhance the decoding process which is enhance the post processing process which takes measurement outcomes and recommends a correction another important uh, another important aspect is that yes we have removed sources of noise by randomized compiling we have basically come from a completely positive trace preserving map to a simple pauli error model but is that is that as good as it as it sounds in the sense have we actually eliminated noise it turns out not really what you have done is you have eliminated some sources of noise but added added to the remaining sources of noise and then we showed that in other words we showed that randomized compiling in some contexts that is coherent errors enhances performance of concatenated codes but for other more general contexts or like general cp maps we showed cases where it can actually add more errors than there was initially and it degrades the performance of the decoders and uh, yeah there are some other interesting problems here which we can look at we can look at not only inserting random pauli gates to to tailor a noise to an effective pauli error model which is easy to work with but look into randomizations that tailor a noise to a different error model that's that is more native to the existing error correction architecture for instance we can imagine uh, doing a randomization scheme that reduces any error process to an effective amplitude damping kind of a noise process or an effective rotation kind of a noise process and these go into uh, twirling with <laughs> arbitrary groups and not the pauli group and then we were also looking at uh, hardware tailored speed ups in numerical simulation so this is can be used information about the hardware to actually help numerical simulations be faster and uh, related to the surface codes we 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 stumbled upon this interesting way of decoding surface codes that has existed uh, for almost a decade which is based on the renormalization group and uh, there seems to be some ways of applying those techniques to also go beyond surface codes to low density parity chip codes okay so i want to just end by coming back to the bigger picture uh what as you know uh, we were looking at these three aspects according to the scale of system so there was microscopic intermediate scale and large scale what we discussed was in the intermediate scale i just want to mention a few other works that we did just because uh, i would be delighted to talk to anyone uh, if you are further interested in those uh, in the microscopic studies i'm currently involved uh, in at a startup called Xanadu where we are looking at continuous variable encodings of quantum information using what is using a class of error correcting codes called gkp codes uh, gottes milky diet scheme codes <clears throat> and i've also worked in on fault tolerance schemes for cat codes in the intermediate scale i'm happy to talk about this class of algorithms called randomized benchmarking algorithms which essentially prescribe experimental characterizations uh, uh, 
of noise, in particular experimental protocols to estimate the fidelity of a device. And for the large scale, which is also a very, very interesting uh, problem because in the asymptotic there are nice physical phenomena. I've, I've worked on things that ask about what is the general hardness of doing quantum error correction. So here the intuition is that quantum error correction should be harder than classical error correction. And there is a way to formally say that, which means that you have to say quantum error correction lies in a computational complexity class, which is known to be harder than a class in which classical error correction lies. And then one can look at these large arrays of qubits, which are called surface codes. We can think about generalized surface codes and linear time decoding techniques there, and also tensor network decoders for quantum and codes. With that, I'd like to leave it here and uh, open it for questions. I'm here today and a little bit of tomorrow, and I'd like to talk to you. Thanks. One uh, on the standard error correction course. So, so when we have more number of qubits, there's also entanglement that just starts you know, entangling qubits, everything. Right? So now these error correction codes do not need to be exactly the way we are looking at the one another system. So what stays in the world in that direction is to see that to mitigate such kind of uh, yes. Uh, so uh, these kind of these surface code architectures are good at studying these kind of, uh, uh, so these kind of errors we call them coordinated errors because then you yeah. have entanglement with some finite scale surface codes uh, the, these array of where you have qubits on the square lattice or some planar lattice these are attractive to study correlated errors because if we take a model of correlated errors we basically think of it as clusters in this surface code and the nice property of the surface codes is that errors that actually corrupt logical information actually go from one boundary of the surface to another boundary. And therefore, it's good at, at, at correcting correlated errors because now we can correct an error proportional to its area and not proportional to its linear dimension. So for these correlated, uh, for correlated errors, uh, surface codes are better suited. The geometry of the hardware also becomes very important. Yes, yes. The geometry of the hardware. In general, like if uh, if we are restricted to planar hardware, then it uh, more it, these kind of uh, surface codes and color codes, in general, topological codes are attractive. So I mean, it actually adds up to my next question also. So what uh, when you are looking at hardware specifically, those things. The errors, okay, it's not about correlations, but then is there a preference of uh, the codes, error correction codes for that? Because you still the that be general. But, uh, yeah, yeah. So, like, this is a good question. Like, uh, in general, we can use metrics like this to, uh, like, rate, rate two error correcting codes depending on the actual error modeling of the hardware. But in general, let's say, let's say the hard, the physics of the hardware says that Z type of errors are more likely than X type of errors. In this case, we can we can in general recommend you want a lattice where one dimension is larger than the other and so on. So in that sense, to an abstract level, we can identify parameters of the noise process which can directly be related to code design. Mentioned like concatenated codes, can you use the same code concatenated over and over again, or do you can use mix up? You just go one after another. Yeah, yeah, good question. So, in the concatenated scheme, it it all depends. In the concatenated scheme, one can use different codes at different blocks. Now it boils down to how how long does the logical estimator method remain efficient for these kind of families. So what we mean by efficient is that if we look at the final number of physical qubits, it actually scales exponentially in the number of layers. 
So we have our logical estimator guaranteed to be polynomial in the total number of physical qubits, but it will be exponential in the size of individual blocks. So if you have different blocks, now the efficiency will actually scale exponentially in the size of the largest block. Also, you can have different blocks. Uh, Stands is popular because it's transverse. Uh, you can be the pi cubic code, which is the minimal one. And that also affects the resource in terms of how many cubits you need. What you are looking at is the error rate, not actually the number of cubits. So that also can be somehow estimating so many uh, qubits, what is the basic configuration by having that or something like that. Yes, yes, exactly. Yeah, so yes, that's true. Like here, what we said was we used the steam code, but one can also use the five qubit code in the sense that the total number of physical qubits will reduce. It'll go as a power of five instead of seven. Yes, so in this case, uh, what uh, what we demonstrated was uh, Let's say, let's say in terms of resources, you say I have seven qubits and I want to see what is the best concatenation scheme. I can concatenate the steel or the cyclic or combinations of this. The logical estimator can now answer these questions in time that is exponential in the size of the steam code block, which is just a constant for us. Um, but we can also put the five qubit code here and they're like, it's kind of an unfair comparison because it's seven qubits versus five qubits, but we can do it. Uh, in general, concatenated schemes, the reason we had to do surface codes was in general, the problem with concatenated schemes is that the measurements we have to do, the stabilizer measurements, they, their weight grows as the, as the layer grows. So if we are looking at the lowest code block, we have weight four measurements, which are the stabilizers of the steam code. If you're looking at the higher code blocks, we have weight 42 measurements to do. So in that sense, concatenated codes are not extremely interesting in the experimental context. One question. Yes. So for this simulation, what is the number of qubits and depth of circuit used? Okay, so for for the simulation uh, for for the simulation data, we have we have used a concatenated code with three layers of concatenation, and this means that uh, this means that we are looking at seven to the three, so that's three hundred forty three qubits. And here, the depth of the circuit, uh, we can now go back to the tree, and we can now think of. Uh, a depth four circuit in every code block here because we have to. Uh, that, uh, that's how the stair, the syndrome measurements are extracted, and so we are looking at four into three, so that's twelve depth twelve. So, any other questions? Can you open the slide? Uh, slide is fifteen to twenty. I think. Uh, that randomized part. Holy error. Uh, because, uh, who's there? Okay. Yeah. Uh, next. Next. Yeah. So, uh, in this randomized coupling, um, compiling, um, there are diagonal elements, and uh, after randomized coupling, there are di only diagonal elements. So other elements are zero. Yes. So yeah. So what it means is that this randomized compiling says that you insert random gates in the circuit, and you look at the average over all those random insertions. So that and guarantees that if you did all possible random insertions, which would be all possible combinations of inserting Pauli gates between circuit elements, then this goes to zero. But now if you did not do all possible gates, you can show that the magnitude decreases exponentially. Okay. Um, so uh, the magnitudes are small. And uh, what about this uh, diagonal elements? They are the same as a whole ones. Yes. In 
I did not tell you what exact representation it is. In a particular representation, which is called uh, the, the Pauli transfer matrix or the kind matrix, it, they are exactly the same diagram. And like I just showed this because now it's intuitive to see rather than saying these are functions of these elements. Mm -hmm. Any questions? Yes. So uh, remember that if you have any four by four matrix, you are looking at any transformations on a vector space with four components. Now, a vector space with four components, we'd like to think of it as representing a density matrix. But it's not any vector, it's those that live on a surface of a sphere called the block sphere. So these are restricted. So that means these transformations have to preserve the fact that these vectors also represent positive matrices with trace one, which means there are additional constraints on these matrix elements. One is that it should it should specify a transformation that preserves positivity, and another it should specify a transformation that preserves the trace of the input. These two mean that you can actually reduce from 16 to 12. Thank you. 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 Thank you.